everyone. We're so pleased to kick off, kick off our fall events with Accelerate Yale today on the first day of Hispanic Heritage Month. We are kicking it off with Financing for the Digital Age, an exclusive conversation with Santiago Suarez, co-founder and CEO of Adi. He is joining us today from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Normally he's in Bogota, Colombia. Thank you so much for joining us. Today's session is co-sponsored by the Yale Latino Alumni Network, also known as YLAN. Thank you very much. My name is Wendy Maldonado D'Amico. I'm Yale College class of 1993, and I'm a member of the leadership team of Accelerate Yale and Yale Angels. Accelerate Yale is a global community of diverse alumni and friends of Yale engaged in innovation, tech, and entrepreneurship. Our mission is to cultivate an active, inclusive ecosystem that thoughtfully promotes meaningful connections and collaborations, while also serving as a bridge between alumni and current Yale students. Please note that we are being recorded this evening with all participants muted. Today's session will be one hour and we will reserve the final 25 minutes for your questions. If you have a question you'd like to submit, you can do so with the little Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You already know the drill. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator for today, my teammate, Adam Brenner. Adam Brenner, Yale College class of 2005, is a partner at DLA Piper and co-founder of Accelerate Yale and Yale Angels. He represents private equity funds, technology companies, and venture capital funds based in the US and abroad on their financings and other corporate transactions. Adam particularly enjoys advising companies and lead investors on strategic company growth, especially national security related technology companies. He also has extensive experience working with emerging growth companies and investors on structuring transactions around international trade manager, matter, matters. And now I'd also like to introduce our guest speaker for today, Santiago Suarez. Santiago is Yale College class of 2007 and he is the co-founder and CEO of Adi, the leading buy now, pay later platform in Latin America, backed by Andreessen Horowitz, Foundation Capital, Monashis, Graycroft, GGV, Intersection Growth Partners, Quana Capital, and Union Square Part Ventures, Union Square Ventures. Prior to Adi, Santiago led strategy and MA at Lending Club and served as a part-time partner at Y Combinator. He founded and led JP Morgan's new product development team and worked on key strategic initiatives for the bank. He started his career at McKinsey. And now I'll turn it over to Adam. So uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. I, I'm really excited to be in dialogue with, uh, with Santiago here. Um, I guess kind of diving in Santiago, um, because we've known each other for a, uh, scary uh, long amount of time. Why don't you walk me through kind of where you are today, what Adi's doing, and uh, so that we can frame that to our audience today. Absolutely, so hi everyone. Uh, delighted to be here from Sao Paulo, Brazil, where it's almost um, nine o'clock. Uh, we are, so just to tell you where we are today, uh, my company's name is Adi. We were actually started three years ago this month in 2018. Um, with Adi, our mission is to make digital commerce a reality in Latin America. And I think one of the things we might talk about later in the future is how payments and the challenge of paying digitally is really what inspires us to do what we do. And part of the reason we started with Buy Now, Pay Later is that we thought that it would be a great way to start building a new payments experience. So what we've done to date is build the leading Buy Now, Pay Later platform in, in the region. We're active in Colombia and in Brazil. We're opening a Mexico office. Uh, we have over a quarter million customers uh, have grown the business about 14 times since the beginning of the year, uh, backed by a wonderful set of investors and just recently announced the second tranche of our $140 million Series B, uh, which is remarkable if you consider that 16 months ago, we lost 99% of our business during COVID. So it's been a heck of a last 14, 15 months. And where we are is, I would say, well, it may seem like we've gone a long way. I like to say we're just getting started in, in our journey to, as I said, make digital commerce a reality in, in Latin America. So 
So building your company in Latin America, how did you decide to do that? Um, you know, I, I know you have a background of working with, you know, large venture funds. Uh, you have a background of working at huge fintech startup, uh, huge fintech companies. Like, why kind of go to a, found your own business and why do it in Latin America? So why found your own business? I would say part of it was. I kept having very strong opinions at every workplace I was in. And I was like, oh, if I were running this, I would be doing that differently. Or, oh, I think that's a really bad idea. And eventually you kind of say, well, if you think you can run the business better, go build your own business. And then you end up realizing that actually things are not as easy when you're throwing peanuts from the peanut gallery than when you're making the decisions. But there was a, there was a real impetus of saying, okay, why don't we go try it out? Like if you, if you, if you think, you can do things better. Let's go try that. As for why Latin America, I mean, I could give you a great story about uh, the macro situation in the region. And in fact, you know, income has tripled. The middle class actually has more than tripled. It's about 600, 700 million people. So it's an incredibly exciting region to be part of. But really the catalyst was that my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, um, moved back. And that really inspired me to start going, learning more about uh, what was happening and then eventually say, actually, I think there's an incredible opportunity to build a great company down here. And, and in many ways, and I think people increasingly are realizing this, entrepreneurship in Latin America can be inspired by what happens in the US, by what happens in China, but it's its own little kettle fish. Mm -hmm. So you know, you could say, oh, we're the a firm for Latin America, but really we're not. We're very different from a firm and very different from Afterpay. We are just building a new way to pay for Latin American consumers from, you know, the Rio Grande to Patagonia. Yeah. I mean, I, it's, I, I was kind of surprised when thinking about this, that it's not just also that you come from the largest city in Colombia or they, that, that your journey has actually been one that's also kind of intimate too. Like I, working with family members, growing that out, and working from specifically from Kali, which has been a place that has had lots of success. Maybe you could actually talk about, you know, that growth rather than just being in the, you know, biggest in, you know, Silicon Valley sector or something like that. Yeah, so, so Kali is an interesting place, and I'm sure maybe eight, based on my circle of friends, about 80% of the people know Kali because of the Narcos uh, series. Uh, which actually did a great job of representing the 90s. And I think a lot of people who grew up in Cali realized that they had to build and chart their own path. And in part because it's, it, I think it has some challenges around dynamism. I think one of the cool things about entrepreneurship is that it doesn't respect existing elite structures. Mm -hmm. So you can actually build your own um, elite structure, so to speak, uh, which I think led a bunch of us to leave, get exposure, and then come back. Um, as you said, I've started the company with someone I've known since I was five. And then the third co-founder is my cousin. So we've, I think we've known each other for about 30 plus years. And that has been a, a wonderful journey. I like to say we like to, you know, at least once a week, I want to throw them out of a balcony and probably at least once a day, they want to throw me out of a balcony, but it's a little bit like an Italian family. Uh, that, that being said, I think it, it gives you an incredible amount of what I'm going to say, trust bandwidth to work through absolutely everything that can come your way. And one of the biggest challenges as a startup team, forget about CEO or executive team as you grow, is you get all these things thrown at you and knowing that you have people that have your back is half the battle. And I think I'll probably the, the biggest challenge as a solo founder is not, oh, I'm a coder and I can't get a sales guy. You probably hire a sales guy or vice versa is really the emotional burden that you have as a solo founder. So having people you trust or who are there batting with you with whom you can have open conversations is absolutely wonderful. And then, yeah, you're right. I mean, like, I think I spent some time in the US I, for a while. I never thought I would move back to uh, Latin America or I would spend time in Latin America, but the opportunity here is so big. And it's not just the economic opportunity, which I think is fantastic. It's also the opportunity to have impact the opportunity to build things that are very different. Um, it's a more nascent region, so you can build more. And you have to be very precise in what you build in the US. You can be a lot more ambitious um, in what you build down in, in Latin America. Yeah, 
And it, it's so taking a step back and looking at your company right now, reading the TechCrunch articles that have come out. Uh, it seems like you all are on this massive and easy trajectory from Andreessen in with your company early to Union Square Ventures to, you know, the most recent Greylock, like you all are, have a lot of great names on your cap table, but maybe you could just walk through a little bit that story and whether it actually just has been success after success or something from there. Um, it has not been success after success. I mean, it's... Uh... It's one of these things where the great thing about being a private company is you choose when you report the news. So it's like Instagram. Like, you know, when you're kind of bummed and sad, you don't post an Instagram photo. Like, you know, it's just a highlight reel. But, but you, see, you see everything. I mean, as I think I mentioned at the beginning, uh, when COVID hit, we lost 99% of our business. And at some point, we had to lay off 60% of our people um, in April, May. So, and, and it wasn't at all clear that the business was going to be viable at that point. And all, all you could do was just kind of hunker down, figure out, okay, how do we make it through the next week? How do we make it through the next week? You start going and going and going and building and building. So I, I would say two things. The first thing is it's very easy to buy your own hype. And while the fact that we went through some of those things means my equity ownership is probably a little bit smaller than it would have been otherwise. I'm actually very grateful we went through that before we're going through where we're going right now because it gives you a sense of perspective and a sense of focus that I don't think you can have otherwise. And then the second thing is, those are really the moments where who you are shows up. And, and in our case, that meant working harder, but it also meant dealing with our colleagues in a very different way. We didn't lose a single executive during that period. Uh, which was awesome. And for a lot of the folks that we laid off have come back, uh, which I think is, 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 I mean, every time one of our laid off engineers comes back, the most recent one came back two days ago, I get so excited because you must have done something right if you laid off someone in May of 2020 and that person feels you treated him or her right enough to come back in the hottest technology market that the region has ever seen. So where are you on an on employee count right now? 272. So, so how do you kind of maintain a culture with, with that many employees across multiple countries and kind of multiple markets, right? How do you keep, keep an Audi culture as you've gone through some tough times also? Um. I mean, we're figuring it out and I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a few things. So actually having gone through the tough times strengthens the culture because it really sharpens your focus and values. You know, our biggest value is a company of owners. We, we, we prize ownership at Addy and we, we put our money where our mouth is, right? So we don't say we're a company of owners, but only the founders get equity. No, screw that. Everyone gets equity. Like, you know, the call center operator has equity. Uh, which, by the way, has led to some fun discussions with our lawyers on like how you do that, blah, blah, blah. But it means everyone is an owner. As one of my colleagues says when we were on the phone with some lawyers and a few non-equity partners, he's like, you realize everyone at Addy is more of a partner than the guy who was just on the phone who doesn't have any equity on that in that law firm. And I'm like, absolutely. Uh, so it really sharpens the values. The other thing is, you have to evolve your role as a founder to be less about execution and more about culture building. Uh, culture building is probably the most important thing you do. And you do it in multiple ways. You do it by showing up and representing and doing things that people are like, oh, that's the way we behave because that's the way the founders behave. But you also do it by onboarding new colleagues. You do it by talking about language. You do it by being really annoying about little things and then making a point about those little things about why they represent a broader cultural value. So it's, uh, and you hope you get those right. Cause sometimes you're just being annoying about little things because you're a founder and sometimes you're annoying about little things. But, uh, but I think being very, very mindful of that. Now in a remote first culture, the most challenging thing you have is how do you onboard junior colleagues? Because, you know, senior colleagues and, and people who are like, call it five, maybe seven to 10 years into their careers, they kind of get the drill. And for them, remote first is actually wonderful. You know, they may have a partner or a young family. They're loving the remote flexibility. If you're 22 and, you know, you and I were hanging out in New York back in those days, yep. your work is your social life. It's actually your meal subsidy because they pay for dinner. 
um, you know, you leave a meeting and your boss, your immediate boss, like the slightly less junior person will pull you aside and say, hey, good job with this. Did you notice this happened? Someone will mute a call in the middle of the call and be like, hey, this is happening because of X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. Those opportunities for mentorship and for culture building, I think are a lot harder to create in a remote first culture. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we also do things that are very deliberate, right? So around writing, we do things around rituals. And you just have to be even more pedantic and more annoying about them. And I think if my co-founders were here, they would say, yep, that's exactly what we have to do um, to, to maintain that sense of culture. Gotcha. And, and so with the, the culture kind of uh, moving along, how has your product changed from that kind of early, early stage to, to now? Obviously, you've tested in the marketplace. It, and it might be helpful also to give people a context of like why this product is relevant in Latin America versus the U.S., where we have different access to, to credit to buy now, pay later options, right? Sure. So the product, just, just so we were clear, we got two products in the market. One, which allows you to pay in three installments at no cost to the customer. And one, which allows you to pay in six to 24 installments with some cost at competitive rates. And for that, we have a partnership with Banco Santander, which is going actually surprisingly well. Um, that is the product. Now, how has it evolved? In many ways, I could tell you not fast enough. But in other ways, the product is incredibly different than it was when we were hanging out in 2018, uh, because the robustness behind it, like the, the, the smarts that go into making a decision about, are you who you say you are? How do we underwrite credit? How do we underwrite identity? How do I onboard a new merchant? And, you know, I think one of the worst things you, you suffer from as the founder and CEO of a company is you only see the things that are not working. You have to con continuously force yourself to say, this is working, this is working, this is working, this is working. So the product actually works quite nicely. Now, the reason this is fun in Latin America is less than 25% of Latin Americans have a credit card. Mm -hmm. So you have 75% of the market that doesn't have a credit card. You have a credit card infrastructure that's totally broken because A, not that many people have it. B, those who have it have very low limits. Limits can be $100 or $200. And C, for a credit card to happen, most people don't know this, your bank needs to approve it, but what's called a payment acquire, which is the merchant side of the transaction also needs to approve it. And merchants suck at approving, uh, acquirers suck at approving transactions in Latin America. Less than 60%, 65% of transactions are approved online. I have a merchant that works with one of the, probably the second largest acquirer in the region, and they see more than half of all their credit card transactions rejected online. So there is an opportunity to build a different way to pay, giving customers a great experience, digital, frictionless, free for payments of three installments or less, and with the convenience of the installment. And that's really what we're building. Gotcha. So, so as you've built that and you know, raised capital for everyone on the call, how do you think about who has been a... I, and, not to throw any investors to the side, but maybe the conversations that didn't work out. Um, how should people be thinking about raising? How should they be thinking about the partners who are going to come in? So I know that you've had different partners. You've had early stage investors who came in and were very key then. And now you have some, some real institutional who are also learning about the region. So I would say a few things. One, the first one is choosing your partner is a luxury. You know, when we started raising our Series B, someone said, what type of investor are you looking for? I said, my answer is any investor, anyone. Like, if you're going to give me money, I am looking for you. Now, if I have a choice, then sure, I'll have some criteria and we'll make a decision. And a huge, re huge part of the reason we ended up working with Union Square, so we were like, John, you know, John's been an investor for a while. He has a very interesting worldview. We said, we want to have that person in our boardroom. And then we've been able to work with our folks who are amazing since then. Um, so I would say choosing your investors is a luxury. I, maybe I just don't want to jinx it, but whenever I raise money, I'm like, I'll take any investor and then we'll get choosy. That's the first thing I would say. Um, the second thing I would say is when you think about fundraising, storytelling is absolutely critical. I was just um, having uh, drinks with the CEO of a Brazilian unicorn. And he said, in the current market, it looks like storytellers are 
overvalued and operators are undervalued. And paradoxically, the role of the CEO is not to operate. The role of the CEO is to tell a story and allocate capital. That's it. You allocate capital, you tell a story, you do not operate. And if you are going to back operators, you're going to do it wrong. That's my sense. Like you can be a great storyteller and a great allocator and a bad operator. doesn't matter. You're going to hire great people because they'll buy your story. You're going to figure out the priorities of the company because you're good at capital allocation. That company is going to be incredibly successful. You're a great operator. Who cares? Who cares? Guess what? Let's say you're the best salesperson. You're like, I don't know, you were the chief revenue officer at Salesforce. Great. You start a company. You've never been an engineer. You've never been an engineering manager. Probably have never done product. You've never done ops. You've never been a legal counsel. Uh, you've never been a CFO. So yeah. this myth of the great operator, it's like, actually, you just need to hire great operators and get out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, along those lines, like telling your story from Latin America, was that hard at all? I mean, I know kind of out of the gate, you were able to get some interest, but have there been people who just don't get it or who have come back around to getting it now? So definitely the latter, uh, which is always fun because investors sometimes have a way. It is funny. You know, one of the cool things about working with an investor who has passed a few times is that you have built that relationship for such a long time that it really works well. Occasionally you find investors, and, and I'll give you an example, uh, both uh, Greycroft and GGV who just came in, we've known them since 2019. Yeah. And we've been in discussions with them at the beginning. They couldn't, but we've built that relationship over time. And that has been absolutely wonderful. And now I'm so excited to have them on the cap table. Occasionally you'll find investors that will say like, no, this is terrible. It'll never work. And then suddenly they're like, oh, we love you. Can we connect this weekend? We're like, well, I yeah. thought there will never work. So if you're going to pass to say, hey, I'm not interested or too early or whatever, just politely leave optionality. Um, but I will say one of the biggest challenges and something that I spend a lot of time talking to Latin American founders about is storytelling. Because one of the biggest advantages I had when I started fundraising, and even now when I fundraise, is I speak American. I mean, my accent has gotten a little thicker since I started spending time here. But you know, I spent six years at JP Morgan. I can put together a deck that looks American. I can talk about unit economics. I can make analogies that allow you in New York to say, oh, I can see how this relates to what this guy is doing in Bogota. As a, and also, I also appreciate the uniquely American art of believing you can change the world through your company, which <laughs> yeah. my wife is always like, she's like, you know, you, I don't understand. My wife who is Colombian. She's like, I don't understand these guys because they'll stand. And her favorite example is the people who stand in a, on a traffic light with their one sign doing a protest. And she's like, why does that happen? And I'm like, well, the same reason that happens is that Elon Musk only, can only happen in America. So as a Latin American founder, you have to be able to tell that story. And a lot of the work I do with Latin founders is not around like, how is your business? It's like, how do we package your story in a way that is attractive for an American audience? So um, kind of a, along that background, could you maybe talk to this audience a little bit about, you know, I don't think you took an entrepreneurship course at Yale. Maybe I'm wrong. I think you, <laughs> you have a master's degree along with your bachelor's degree, but I think it was in a different area. But, you know, maybe you could tell a little bit about how Yale and the Yale education impacted this company or, or did it? Uh, it did. Um, so I have, a, I have a master's degree in political science, which as my political science thesis advisor said, great, now you're qualified to drive a taxi because a master's degree in political science effectively qualifies you for apparently driving a taxi at the words of Donald Green, who was at Yale at the time, now at Columbia. Um, you know, I think I would say the following thing. I would say a liberal arts education is luxury. Um, because it's one of those things that uh, mediocre liberal arts education is probably the worst thing you can do. But a great liberal arts education at the time, at least Yale had an incredible liberal arts education. Um, it's a true gift because it really forces you to change the way you think. And it, it is deeply uncomfortable. I mean, one of the great things about a Yale education is that it's very uncomfortable. It challenges you in many ways. It forces you to... Um, you know, 
confront and grapple with opposing viewpoints. It's incredibly deep. It's very much historical. Um, I spent also a lot of time doing statistics, which was wonderful in terms of like learning how to do math. But, uh, but I think that the, the, the biggest thing that I would say it gave me was this kind of like broad, and, broad analytical toolkit. And I don't mean, can you use Excel? It's really can, like, can you systematically approach a problem? Mm -hmm. And then can you also have just a tiny bit of epistemological humility around what actually is happening and where and how, and can you bring curiosity to anything you do? Um, so, and, and, and obviously you can do that because you spent four years at this beautiful idyllic campus in New Haven, uh, hanging out with people like you, uh, who will challenge you, will can change the way you think, but I, I mean, I will also say beyond the very obvious benefits of the university around access, career, blah, de, blah, de, blah, which I think are, are great, uh, you know, for someone like, like me to come from a small, like a mid-sized town in Colombia and get a full ride to this university. I had never been to the U.S. before I went to Yale and then get there and get this massive exposure to this world-class institution education it was life-changing. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and I, I think that's a that's a story for a lot of people. I think, you know, the ongoing challenge and, and what we're trying to address here at Accelerator Yale is making sure that, you know, there is connectivity and awareness in the entrepreneurial community. And like, I think there is a renewed focus um, at Yale, but there can always be more on kind of like how you build an entrepreneurial ecosystem. You know, could you have learned certain lessons or incubated companies while at Yale? And the other is, yeah, and, and I, I would say the one thing I would say about Yale, and if I could make one point on that is um, don't try to be something you're not. If, if, you, if we try to be the Stanford of the East Coast or the MIT yeah. of Connecticut, like it's not going to work. Or it just doesn't work. Now, can we always beef up the science team? Probably. But, but it's really around fostering, I mean, at least at the time and I, I query where things are headed today, I think Yale was a place that valued intellectual risk taking. And I had some incredible academic mentors and also some inspiration like peers that were just incredibly advanced, but people would take these very interesting, fun intellectual risks. And there is a parallel between that and taking a uh, business risk. Now, one of the things that's interesting, and I think you and I were talking about this right before our call, is that unlike intellectual risk, which from the very beginning is incredibly rewarding and difficult, a lot of the early days of business risk looks very manual. Mm -hmm. It looks very manual. I mean, you're just you're just three people. I mean, if you're not if you don't know how to code, your your job is your job is glorified gopher. You know, I would get pizzas for our engineers, like make calls, print things that needed to be printed, buy computers for the neon, neon boardies. Um, so I get it. It's not as sexy, but obviously the moment it, the moment it clicks, uh, it's a very different experience. So do you miss it all being, you know, having been at JP Morgan on the VC side, do you miss that world and that perspective of uh, wearing the investor hat and also having kind of the deep pockets of that? Um, I like the investor hat. I like that, that piece because you're, A, you're not totally indexed on one company. So diversification is good. Uh, B, you get to play in different places. So you can spend the mornings with you. Then you do the afternoons with the guys doing AirPods or whatever. Um, but, but, I'll tell, but I don't miss it. I mean, one of the cool things about building a company is that you're building. You're, you're doing your own thing and it is difficult. It's incredibly challenging. Um, it's a little bit like climbing. Um, you know, one of the cool things about rock climbing as I, I spent some time between JP Morgan and Lenny Club, I took a year off to just go climb around the world is you're so scared. And when you start climbing, you're so scared. And then you say, oh, if I get better at climbing, I will be less scared. And then you go meet people who are like really good at climbing and they're like, nope, I'm still very scared. And it's just like, you just realize that when you get better at climbing, all you do is climb harder things. Mm -hmm. And you're always scared. And actually part of the cool thing about this, the sport or the activity is that psychological element. I don't think anyone likes to climb 
the same way that like climbing is not running, like the psychological elements there. And it's the same thing with the entrepreneurship. So it gets better. You get more perspective. You start enjoying yourself more, but there's always a piece of, you know, I've never run a company like my company. I mean, my company today is 13 times the size of my company in February. And in six months, it'll be some multiple of the size. And I mean, a lot of people, like if you're a Procter & Gamble, you spend three years in your job and then you move to a bit, bit bigger job and then you move to a bigger job. And here your job itself is changing every three months. Yeah. And you got to keep up. So you're always terrified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> you just, someone just shouted out climbing and building a company is a great analogy and already. So they're, they're, the audience is excited about that. Um, I, I guess... One thing I wanted to ask before we go to Q&A, because we always want to make time for that, is where do you see Latin American tech going? You know, I, I love the fact that I am a venture capital attorney in New York, frankly, because I get to work with great founders in the, on the East Coast. I do work with plenty of companies out West, and, but lots of people in Europe and, and in other markets. I like be having a little bit of a chip in our shoulder. And I think it's good to not just be the same as California. As you were saying, Yale shouldn't be the same as Stanford. Where do you think Latin America goes? Same, same, same place. And I will tell you the biggest difference between when I started now, uh, three years ago and now, and I haven't been doing this for long, that long. I mean, it feels like ages, but it's three years, is the quality of the founders. And that's because when I started certainly outside Brazil, the ecosystem was so small. But now you got people from Rappi, people from Nubank, people from Creditas, all of these places, and they go and build companies and they have been at great companies. Yeah. And that flywheel is amazing because great founders attract great talent. I mean, you know, we just hired a fellow Yaley, um, Nikki Sri Kumar, and she came from a firm advice. And what's cool about this is on the one hand, delighted to work with like an incredible product leader that who also is a Yaley and a woman in technology. Amazing. But on the other hand, a lot of her team will be Colombian and Brazilian. And they're going to be learning from someone who is like an incredible product leader from Silicon Valley. What are they going to do? They're going to take those skills and maybe start a company, maybe take it to their next job. And you're in, like the, the, the talent skill is growing dramatically. And that's incredibly exciting. Yeah, no, I and and I remember it wasn't that long ago when New York was like pumped about one of its first like IPOs in Etsy or something like that, which is crazy that that like happened in our lifetime. And now when you think about the number of New York tech companies that have IPO'd, London's getting there in a similar way. A lot of these, it just takes that, and then people start reinvesting in the community, and you have a really aggressive ecosystem. So it's fun. So sorry, I know Wendy just hopped on because she wants us to jump to Q and A. I actually, Wendy. Uh, if you don't mind, I wanted to ask one from a, a founder who's, who's um, building an early stage company kind of in the, in the same uh, world, Ola. Um, and Ola is someone who I've spoken to um, and I think is doing some really interesting stuff. Um, Ola wanted to know kind of how did you figure out raising debt and equity? Um, not because obviously your story is one of also having debt alongside of that. A, a lot of, you know, founders will have an SVB line, but were your products a little different? And were there tactics that work differently for you there? And what would you do if you did it all over again? <laughs> the last um, one is so the what I do one. If I did, I, I mean, I don't know. I'll, I'll take the rate that, that in equity. And I actually wrote a blog post around how to raise debt because raising debt is very different than raising equity. Equity is all about, you know, talking about storytellers versus operators. Storytellers raise great equity, operators raise debt. Because as a debt investor, you don't care about the freaking story. All you have is downside. Coupons capped at 16%, 15, 12, whatever. Um, but your downside is awful. So as a, as a debt investor, you actually want operators. Uh, look, how do you raise debt and equity? I used to be very dogmatic about it. And I would say, like, you always got to raise debt because it shows that you can lever the book and you don't want to use your equity to lend money. And generally speaking, I think that's roughly speaking true. So if you're lending money, fund the book. Um, if you're investing in sales, marketing, et cetera, raise, debt, uh, raise equity. But it can always go up and forth, right? So we now raise this big equity round. It basically allows us to be a little choosier in how we choose debt. Now, I will say some investors, equity investors, will want you to have raised debt multiple times 
to show that you can raise debt. Because if you're, if you're in a lending business and you cannot raise debt, this business is going nowhere, zero, you're done. Um, so that's the way we've thought about it. How would I do it all over again? Um, God, so many ways, but uh, maybe raise the Series A a little bit later uh, would be a, one that comes to mind. Focus on the value of storytelling. Like it is, it is funny. I, I spent all my time telling the freaking story. I, I interview people. I talk to colleagues. I talk to partners. But it took me a while to figure out the importance of storytelling in in fundraising. Best book I've read on fundraising: Billion Dollar Loser, like by far the best book. It just shows the power of storytelling. You have a not great business, blah blah blah. If you have a great story, you'll race. So there are a number of things about the book that I would say do not emulate, but it is it is an example of how story how much storytelling can matter in a venture market. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll let Wendy jump in with some of the questions. Thank you so much, though, Santiago. Sure. Thank you. It's super interesting. Um, so we have lots of great questions here. I'm going to try to get to all of them. If I don't get to your answer, uh, to your question, rather, please forgive us. Okay, so Pian Pian has a question for you. Santiago, what do you think is the key for finding product market fit and growing users? And what do you think are the best things early stage founders should be spending time on? Um, key to finding product market fit, um, experiment get closer to the users and iterate and the best thing you can do and this is hard because and that and i would say so to answer the first part of the question experiment get close to the users iterate um the best advice on this comes from paul graham he's written an incredible series of essays that are available on his website around finding product market fit a lot of people then ask well how do i know that i have found product market fit and the answer is you know like you will know, and you will know because everything will break. Nothing will work. Your lines will be overwhelmed. Your email starts overflowing because people want more of what you're selling. So it's actually not that like, oh, I wonder if we found product market fit. No, no, no. You either found or you didn't find it. Um, and then best thing founders can spend their time on, it really depends on the founder. I mean, if you are a coder, it you're doing some stuff. If you're a salesperson, you do different things. Um, I would say, but just get being closer to the users, just being closer to your users, just understand what they're doing, understand what they're doing. It's, it's, it's the biggest thing. Uh, don't scale before you have product market fit. Thank you. Uh, someone wants to know, it's increasingly competitive to hire great talent. What strategies or tactics do you find are working for you? I mean, you're starting to scale. So talk to us about that. Um, culture. Culture is the biggest one. I mean, pay pay good salaries, sure. Who cares? Um, having a great and critically a defined culture, I think, is the best way of attracting talent. And that starts with a compelling mission. That starts with very clear values. That starts with a very clear way of working. Because it'll allow you to do two things. One, um, filter the people that don't want to work at your company. And if you're trying to appeal to everyone, you're appealing to nobody. So it's better to have a very clear, very well-defined culture that says, this is what we like to do here. And you may thrive, you may not, but that's how we operate. And then it also self-selects for people to say, yeah, those are my people. And when you have someone saying, yeah, those are my people, those people are not going anywhere. And we saw, I mean, look, we saw it last year, uh, major FinTech came into Columbia, try to do, talk to a bunch of our folks. I think they were, they, we didn't lose a single person. Um, and it was because I think people know why they work with us and they know what we bring to the table. And it's not about the salary. I mean, you have to pay good salaries, obviously treat people fairly, but it's really around culture, talent development, finding the right, finding your tribe. And if you find your tribe, uh, you want to stay there. So I'm curious, Santiago, just to drill down on that a little bit more. Um, you're one of the first people we've interviewed who has talked about instituting a strong culture from the beginning when you're building your company. Is this something that you went into Adi knowing that you would want to build from the very beginning? Or was there some sort of light bulb moment that made you think, 
oh, wait a second, if I wanna keep these great people, I better make it the kind of place where they want to come back time and time again. Like how, how did you know to build this culture piece in as, as a way to attract and keep talent? Um, Cause I think to, to my previous point in my discussion with Adam, um, I had worked at places with great culture and at places with really bad culture. I was like, I want to work for a place that I want to be part of. And I remember before we even incorporated the company, I remember meeting with my two co-founders in the common room of one of one of their buildings uh, to talk about our values and our rituals. And it felt so um, contrived, <laughs> like here you are, you know, you have no company, no money. And you're like, let's talk about the values that we bring to the table. And you're just like, oh, and what are the rituals that we want to espouse? And it felt really contrived. It felt even kind of fake. And, and I'll give you an easy example. We decided from day one that we would run the company in English. So from day one, every single document at Addy is in English. And for the first 12 months, it was just a bunch of Colombians. So you would have a bunch of Colombians talking in Spanish because we're not going to go all the way out there. And then notes would get typed in English. All the code was done in English. The wiki is done in English. The product, the BRDs are written in English. And you, everyone would be like, occasionally you would have a new doing. I'd be like, why do we write in English if it's a bunch of Colombians? And we would say, because at some point we won't be just a bunch of Colombians and you want to make sure those people are effective collaborators. And guess what? We hired a dude that didn't speak Spanish easy to onboard. Then we hire more, then we hire more. Then we went to Brazil and now you have Portuguese and Spanish. So what's the, what's the language? English. And everything's done in English. The old hands are done in English. We actually have three English teachers, full-time like colleagues of ours, like full-time employees legally. And when you join the company, if you don't have a good English level, uh, we'll assess you, we'll level you, and then we'll have uh, English classes so you can actually continue to progress. Wow. Okay, interesting. Uh, all right, let's move on to some other questions. Um, here's a good question. Historically, there haven't been many successful fintech companies that can span both Brazil and Mexico. What makes Audi different and what has been your approach to ge geographic expansion in a competitive Latin American BMPL market? So I would say uh, we're not live in Mexico yet precisely for that reason. Um, our approach I mean, without going, telling too many tales out of school, uh, what's our approach to geographic expansion? Our approach to geographic expansion is that it should follow from having a great product. Um, the second thing I would say about BMPL expansion in Latin America and expansion in general is that BMPL is a very, very funky, difficult product to build. And what you see over the top is like an iceberg. I was like, oh, I could do that. I could just do like, you know, three installments and you're done. The amount of work that happens around risk management, fraud, credit, funding, booking, um, merchant acquisition and tooling, customer retention and loyalty. For a successful BNPL company to exist, it needs to build three mini companies in one. It needs to, needs to build a Stripe, Adi and checkout.com company. It has to build like an acquire that can get businesses to do payments. It needs to build its own network, so Visa, MasterCard style, something that allows transactions to happen. And it needs to build its own credit card company, so it allows customers to pay in one. And a lot of the work that makes this company successful has nothing to do with the UX. It's a lot to do with the pipes that happen back. So as we think about our competitive differentiator, it's like, you know, we, we've been doing this since before BNPL was hot. And a lot of the work we've been doing is around building those fundamental pillars. And it's the reason our company can grow 14, 15 X in a span of nine, 10 months, and it doesn't blow up. If you grow a balance sheet business that fast without strong foundations, you will blow up. So Santiago, uh, just a question for me, one more, if the audience will put up with it. So why isn't, you know, PayPal jumping into Latin America in that way and just, you know, competing? Um, why, or, or are they trying, are companies like that trying an Amazon or something like that to go into Latin America, own the marketplace, and rather than actually founders from Latin America building businesses that then go and actually can compete? So I can't comment on Amazon. Um, I'll let you and our panelists decide how they like the PayPal product experience. 
Um, and and I think there's a lot of great talent at PayPal, but it's just like a different product which means built yeah. eight years ago. Um, I mean, you could, and and nothing prevents you from doing that. I think, and by the way, I think one of the things I I think about as a lot of American founder is if you do not believe you can compete with a firm after pay Klarna, choose your competitor, yeah. don't start a company um, because they will come. Now you get an advantage, uh, you can get going. Um, but part of the challenge is exactly what I just said. A lot of the, if you build a company in the US and a lot of these giants are built in the US or Europe, they use a bunch of the infrastructure that is not available in an emerging economy. And you do not realize how critical that infrastructure is until you don't have it. Um, so that that at least is our our view. The, the other thing, and, and I think one of our investors said that recently, it's kind of like the the joke about the rabbit and the fox. And this is Angela from the region, right? Who says, uh, when a big company goes into Latin America, it's a little bit like, why does the rabbit run faster than the fox? And it's because the rabbit's running for his life the fox is running for its dinner. And, and it's the same thing at the end of the day. I mean, a lot of these guys go down. If it doesn't work, the U S will remain. That's where they focus on for us. This is, this is the market. There's no plan B plan C. So you got to win. A yeah. um, couple more questions here. Do you foresee any opportunities to take advantage of the open banking waves implementation happening in Brazil? A hundred percent. That's uh. That's a big reason why uh, that we, we came to Brazil. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Brazil is an incredibly progressive place for fintechs. Uh, so obviously, it's probably the best place to get debt funding for a fintech company. It is also an incredibly friendly place from a regulatory standpoint. And I don't mean it in like a free-for-all. I just mean it's progressive. It's well thought out. You can apply for licenses. Uh, they have this thing called PIX, which is the new integrated real-time payment system. Um, so it's, um, I like to explain, it's kind of like if the central bank, it's like the Federal Reserve launch Venmo. That's what PIX is. You get your PIX ID. You can send people pay uh, money in real time sponsored by the central bank. And they also have open banking, which allows you to grant access to people like us uh, to your bank account data and you can port your bank account data. So for underwriting purposes, it's incredibly powerful. So uh, yeah, no, I mean, look, part of the reason we decided to come to Brazil is we saw open banking. We saw a progressive and thoughtful uh, central bank regulator and we said, we got to go do it. Interesting. Okay. Here's another question. Uh, companies are raising much bigger rounds uh, as well as closing rounds sooner. What do you think is driving this? And what are your thoughts on the macroeconomic conditions, uh, macroeconomic conditions, especially as it relates to raising debt? Um, I think it's a great time to raise debt. Uh, it's a great time to raise equity. Um, so go raise money, go raise money. And if you can raise debt, go raise debt. Absolutely. Make it happen. Um, what's driving that? I, I mean, I think, I don't know. I, I stopped trying to predict things like this. And, and the answer is if I knew I would probably make a living doing something a little easier than build a company. But, uh, but I think there are a few things. One is obviously when you have secularly low rates, everyone looks for yield. So equity becomes more attractive. Uh, secondly is, I think we are, and, and I'm going to sound like a, one of these evangelists, I think we're in an incredibly exciting time in kind of history and technology development. So if you look at a place like Latin America, where you have, you know, smartphone penetration approaching well over 100%, if you just count smartphones over people, internet penetration in the 80s and 90s, and yet credit card penetration in the 25%. That's a huge opportunity. And that opportunity has nothing to do with GDP, has nothing to do with the inflation print for the next quarter. It has everything to do with the fact that you have all these people who are just coming online. And if you're going to bet on someone saying, I can scale the business and bring it online, that's an incredible bet to make. And, and that's a lot of what, what I think would, would, uh, would work well. So yeah, um, that's, uh, but I, I mean, I think a lot of people are kind of scratching their heads um, on why and how. I think as an entrepreneur, if you can get great funding from great partners, get it. But it's also, um, I think people have been saying that companies are overvalued since 2009. I left San Francisco in 2011. 
And everyone said in 2011, this is a bubble, we're done. So I moved back to New York to work at JP Morgan, evidently the safe career choice. And it's 10 years later and valuations keep increasing. 10 years yeah. later. So uh, um, like at some point you just gotta say, you wanna build a sustainable business. You don't wanna build a business that's depending on these crazy capital cycles, but you probably wanna stop predicting the doomsday coming every, anytime soon. Yeah, and, and I mean, as we know, so much of this has to do with the fact that there are new investors being created daily and new venture funds being created daily. There are, and for every exit that isn't a great exit, there's still someone on that, on that, de- on that uh, cap table who all of a sudden went from having no cash to a couple million who wants to invest back in the ecosystem. Venture capital is just becoming part of what everyone's investing in. So, yeah. So, Santiago, um, we're we're starting to run low on time here, but I, I want to get it in my own question here too, right? So, uh, so one of uh, so our next speaker uh, who's going to address the community Yale community next week is going to be talking about diversity and hiring. Um, I'm really curious about whether that topic is something that people in Latin America are talking about with regards to hiring and promotion and. Uh, just the way that they are operating and running their companies. Is there any discussion or active work around including women and underrepresented people into startups and established companies in Latin America, including yours? I would say from a system level, we're nowhere near the U.S. And, and I would say from a conversation level, we're not. I mean, you'll you'll speak to... You'll speak to search firms and you'll say, I want to see a diverse slate. And they look at you like, what, what are you talking about? And you're like, well, this is what we want to see. And, and, and there's still this deer in the headlights uh, view. Um, I think in some places you, you do have, you actually do have the formal, like uh, it's called in Colombia, La Ley de Quotas, which requires certain representation, certain areas and certain boards. But I think we're maybe five years behind for, from where the U.S. is, right? I mean, in the U.S., I think, diversity, equity, and inclusion is a real topic uh, that is forefront. I don't see it in Latin America. I mean, we just conducted uh, three exec searches and that was a big area of focus for us. Can you find amazingly talented women and underrepresented uh, groups uh, to show up? And, that, and, and we do it in a way that's principled. We do it in a way that <coughs> allows us to create great talent. And you got to put the onus on the search firm. In our case, for example, I mean, you're getting, doing a C-level search, you usually use a search firm. Could you say, don't just go talk to the <coughs> 10 people you know, and we're paying you over six figures, go make, go to your, go to your job. Um, so <coughs> that's the way we think we've thought about it. I don't, I don't yet see the change in the way that we would like to see it. Uh, we try to do it ourselves, um, but I, I, I think we're, we're, we're well behind where the U.S. is. And to just follow up on that, um, what do you see in Latin America with regards to female founders uh, starting companies? Are you seeing any sort of trends there? Oh, it is one of the most exciting developments. I mean, you know, it's so fun. Uh, so we've got, um, I mean, I'll give you a few. We've got Bryn McNulty uh, from Hobby. Um, they just raised $100 million from SoftBank. Uh, you've got Cristina Cheverri from Mooney. Um, I'm an investor in a company called Naver, um, Cate Castillo. And these women are outstanding. They're fierce. They're great. Um, it's actually one of the most exciting developments I've seen in the region in the last 12 months, 12 to 18 months. You're seeing really talented female founders. Uh, Chipper, which is uh, a company we know well. Uh, Caro Garcia is one of the three founders. And that woman is a rock star. I mean, she leads the Mexican operation, leads revenue for, every, for the entire company. Um, so we're actually seeing a lot of that. Uh, and it's really exciting. And, and, and they, they take no, I mean, they take no quarter. Um, they're just as, as driven and, and super inspiring. So, and I'm lucky to back a couple of them, but uh, yeah, no, we've seen, we've seen that be a very big change from when I went down there three years ago. That's really exciting. Okay. Adam, do you want to ask Santiago another one last question before I pivot to closing things down here? Um, I mean, um, Wow, I, I didn't know that I would be put on the spot right there. Oh, but, I'm uh, sorry. I, I, no, 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 no. You have I, a couple I, minutes, I guess, so I wanted to give no, them to I, you. No, I think it's, um, so, so Santiago, um, 
you know, when, when thinking about how you will, uh, and, and this is a light question, how you're going to continue to meet the challenges, because obviously you now are, you know, are at least relatively well capitalized, right? How do you keep growing? How do you take, how do you, you know, confront the new challenges of kind of hypercharging growth and going from here? Spending a lot of time um, learning. I, I mean, I think, I think one of the things that I saw this post uh, that Tyler Cowen wrote not too long ago about like, he asks the people like, what do you do that is the equivalent of a pianist uh, practicing the scales? And I think a lot of people just say, at some point they kind of give up formal training, so to speak, and, and they stop training and you stop learning. And I think one of the things, cool things about this job is you can't afford to do that. So um, I, I tinker with it all the time, right? So I've got an executive coach, which is something I totally endorse and recommend, but it's also like your time drives priorities and, or I should say your priorities drive your time, but how you spend your time drives the company and their priorities. I spent a lot of time tinkering with my calendar. I think my assistant thinks I'm totally nuts. Um, cause I, I spent time working with that. I spent time not doing anything. I think one of the biggest shifts you have to do as a founder is as one of our investors said, bring great people and get the fuck out of the way. And it's very different than the first time, like in your first year or two or whatever, your job is not that your job is to do everything yourself. And then now your job is bring great operators that can take you to the next level. Um, and, and that's, so your job changes, one of the values we have as a company is introspection. And so we, I spend a lot of time introspecting, probably more so than I should. Uh, I probably spend more time sleeping than I did six months ago. So I, I, at least I try. So it, it, it just, at this point, my ability to influence outcomes is a lot more about org design, hiring strategy than do I spend you know, until midnight, uh, sending emails to potential customers. If I'm doing that, something is fundamentally broken at the company. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much, Santiago. Okay, so let's wrap it up. Um, Santiago, I just wanted to thank you so much for joining the Accelerate Yelp community this evening. Um, and I'm just going to ask everybody, please don't log off just yet. A couple things, I, a couple of announcements. Um, first, I wanted to thank everyone who joined us tonight for the webinar um, and for sending in great questions. We also wanted to thank our co-sponsor, the Yale Latino Alumni Network, YLAN, and the Yale Alumni Association Shared Interest Groups uh, who support our webinars. Uh, I wanted to let everybody know that a recording of tonight's webinar will be posted on our LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, and LinkedIn and Facebook pages, as well as our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to that. Our next conversation will be on, on September 21st at 8 p.m. with Porter Braswell, founder and CEO of Jopwell, who will talk about diversity as a superpower. And finally, last but not least, this is very exciting. We're having another pitch competition, everybody. Uh, we are focusing on female and underrepresented founders. Uh, and the five finalists for the competition from the Yale community will receive valuable pro bono services from Yale alumni, including Adam here. And the winner will take home a prize of $10,000. That is double the amount that we offered back in February. So please go to yaleangels.org to find out more information about the criteria uh, and uh, the registration and sending in your pitch deck. And the deadline to submit a pitch deck is this coming Monday, September 20th at midnight Eastern. So get those pitch decks into us, please spread the word. Um, and we wanna see what we come up with for a great competition on October 26th. So that's pretty much it. I wanna thank everybody once again and have a great evening. All right, thanks. Thanks again, Santiago, really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Wendy, you, thank you, Adam. All right, take care. All right, bye-bye.